Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Second 2020 9 a.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey. With us today we have Vice Chair Steve Carter, uh, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. So um, with that, uh, Vice Chair Carter, would you please lead us in the invocation and pledge? Join me in prayer, please. Father God, as we seek your presence this morning, dear Lord, we seek a peace in our community. We seek for you to bring about communication we seek for you to bring about sharing, and most importantly, dear Lord, caring. We seek, dear Lord, for you to guide us and direct us, give us wisdom and courage to deal with the issues we face each day. We seek, dear Lord, for you to guide the deliberations of this body this morning, that the actions we undertake will be acceptable in your sight. Most of all, dear Lord, we seek your mercy and grace on us as leaders in our community and on our community at large, dear Lord. We ask for you to be with us today. Give us peace and comfort and safety. We ask all these things, dear Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 You would stand and address the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the first item on the agenda is public speakers for agenda-related items. I believe we have one person who has uh, requested that we call her this morning um, for the agenda item number seven, six, the Snow Camp Mine update. That's Stephanie Thurman. That is correct, Madam Chair. So while she is getting Stephanie Thurman on the line, I'll just uh, tell the, the audience, those who are watching online, that uh, we're limited in the number of people that can attend personally today because the overflow room is being used by the court system. And so our public comments are limited to email and people who requested that they be called. Hello, we are not available now. Please leave. All right, so Ms. Tharman did not answer the phone when uh, we called her, and there is no one else who requested to be called on agenda related items. Is that right? That's correct. All right, thank you. So we'll move forward. Um, there's no, I assume, commissioner's responses. So, next item is approval of the agenda. I'll move. Second. Approve. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Lashley. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone opposed? Next is the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by uh, Vice Chair Carter and a second by Commissioner Lashley to approve the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, the first item of business is a presentation about the Alamance Recovery Loan Program. Uh, we have Mac Williams from the Chamber of Commerce, Fairfax Reynolds, who's been serving as the chair of that, uh, the committee that was formed for this purpose, and Scott Schomburg here today to present. So, good morning, nice to see you. Fairfax, how you doing? Good morning, I'm doing well. Good to see you. Thank you all for giving us time on your agenda this morning. I know it's a busy day. Uh, we did want to give you an update on the Alamance Recovery Loan Program for small businesses and uh, you all were so instrumental in the funding of that program and we certainly 
appreciate that. I ch I'm chair of the oversight committee for the program, which is why I'm here today. Uh, our 15 member committee is made up of representatives from throughout the public and private sectors of the county who understand the need for a vibrant small business community are concerned about its post-pandemic future. In a moment, I'll ask Scott Schomburg from Self-Help Credit Union to give you an update on application and loan approvals in the program. Um, I'm sure you remember that Self-Help is our chosen partner for the program and they're involved in the credit underwriting and the lending and, and uh, have been a terrific partner and a terrific part of, uh, of, the, of the program. Uh, we've gotten off to a successful start. Um, let me make a few comments before Scott comes up. First, uh, a thank you to you, the commissioners, for your financial commitment to the loan program. Thank you to Commissioner Gailey and thank you to Commissioner Carter for your involvement in the oversight committee. Uh, your input has been valuable and it's, it's appreciated. From the beginning when the Alamance Chamber and the Alamance Community Foundation started investigating a small business loan pool, uh, we realized that we needed uh, $250,000 to $300,000 and were advised that we needed that much really to make the program impactful and sustainable. So um, you provided $200,000 in addition to the $100,000 that was committed by the Ac Economic Development Foundation to fund the program and that's the reason that it got off the ground. I'm here to uh, to tell you today that we're very pleased that since we uh, initiated the program 90 days ago, we have another $50,000 committed to the program from a local foundation. Um, Impact <coughs> Alamance committed that money. Um, and, and so we're at $350,000. We continue to pursue public and private funds and hope to continue to grow the fund in the future. The recovery loan pool is designed to target small businesses who are underserved by traditional lenders and with little access to capital sources to help them weather the pandemic and recover from it. Therefore, in our marketing, we're placing particular emphasis on focusing on businesses owned by people of color, businesses in the Latino X community, and women-owned small businesses. We've offered both virtual and face-to-face -face events to pursue potential applicants from these sectors and we've had some success. Additionally, applications must include the underlying financial information needed for loan approval. This has been an obstacle, I must admit, but through Urban Allen and the ACC Small Business Center as well as through self-help resources, all efforts are being made to assist applicants in gathering and preparing information they need for successful application. It's still early. The committee recognizes that there's still great financial strain in our small business community that can be relieved through this program, but it is off to a great start. With your help, groundwork has been laid for a valuable long-term community resource. Let me now call on Scott Schomburg to give us a report on the program applications and loan approvals through the first 90 days. Welcome. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. morning. How's everyone? Um, thank you so much for having me here. And on behalf of Self Help, I would like to thank the commissioners. Uh, this program, this valuable program, we hope to use as kind of an example throughout North Carolina. So Alamance County should be very proud of that. Um, just a few things on the demographic part of um, the uh, loan program. Right now, we have 25 applications in process. Of those applications, we've approved and funded 10. It's a total of $162,600. So of the 350, we're almost to 50%. We have two additional loans totaling $15,000. Um, so the, the 10 loans that have closed, we've had five female borrowers and five male, five black or African-American, one Asian and four white borrowers, three hair salons, two restaurants, a child care, an auto repair shop, a gym, an accountant, and a vending company. Many of these applications, as Fairfax mentioned, are still working with us in regards to their um, uh, financial information. That has been a um, probably something that was expected, but it's been more of a challenge than I even thought. 
Um, but Irvin Allen over at the Alamance Community College has been working with us and um, done a great job. These applicants, none of them would have been able to be served by the banking community here in Alamance County just because of the constraints they have. Uh, Self-help has a program that allows us to do this and we're very happy to be partners. So once again, I can't thank you enough and we look forward to working with you in the future. Good program. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Um, just to wrap up, um, uh, we're almost at 50%. It's a great milestone and we wanted to, to let you know of that. Um, there's still tremendous needs out there. We know there are small businesses that don't know this resource is available, and so we will continue to pursue them um, every avenue we can. Um, and uh, we just want to assure you that the funds you've committed to this program will be used and that uh, will be used in a way that has the greatest impact. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Did anybody have any questions for either of them? It's good. Good job. All right. Very nice. All right, next we have a request to set a public hearing regarding economic consent of from Mac Williams, the president of Alamance Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, Mac. How are you doing? Doing Good just morning. fine. Thank you very much. Good morning to each of you. Uh, to keep the economic development news going, uh, I'm here to uh, ask for you folks to set the date for a public hearing. Uh, the date would be November 16th at 7 o'clock uh, if, if it works for you. Uh, to uh, set a date for uh, incentives for uh, Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the company that's looking to come through the process. Right. And that's the food? The Chick-fil-A. The Chick-fil-A. The Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. Chick yeah. 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 But it's, it's not for a restaurant. Oh, it's not? <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's right. for... So, yeah. type. they should be giving us incentive. I mean, that's <laughs> well, uh, anyway, that's that's my role today is to uh, uh, inform you of the of the company name and to ask for the date to be set for the for your hearing. Great opportunity for Alamance County. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion that we second do that. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Boswell and a second from Mr. Carter to set uh, economic development public hearing regarding uh, incentives for Chick-fil-A on November 16th at 7 p.m. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. Thank you very much. We'll see you November 16th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, now I'm hungry for some Chick-fil-A. <laughs> All right, uh, Tanya Cattle, our planning director, has a request to set a public hearing for our land development plan update. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Tanya. Thank you. So the request today is, let's take that off for a minute, is to have a public hearing set for November 16th, same as Max, for 7 p.m. This is for the land development plan. A little history for us, the, the commissioners voted June 15th of last year to move forward with the update to the land development plan. In October 2019, I was before you all, we had selected Stewart as our consultant and hired and presented to commissioners on that day. Planning department, along with Stewart and the subcommittee for the plan have moved forward through COVID. We have done quite a bit of public outreach in a very different way than what we've ever done before, but probably more successful than we've ever had before in reaching out to many, many more people than we did in our previous life when we did individual meetings and out in the community. So we've been very pleased with that. Uh, the draft is out for review. It is on the planning website and then the Alamance County Plan website, which is where all the land development plan information is, all the presentations, all that information is out there. Um, the planning board also heard a presentation very similar to what you all will hear this morning on October 15th. So they got informational session as well, and they will vote on uh, an approval at their meeting next week. And then we'll bring it to you all on November 16th, should we be able to hold that public hearing. What we'd like to do is do a small presentation for y'all this morning. Jake from uh, Stewart, there is, is um, in the back and he'll take care of the presentation for us. Great, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
So I'm uh, going to give you a brief presentation here, talk a little bit about the project schedule and goals and recommendations to small area plan for snow camp uh, and then uh, next step steps. And then if you all have any questions, uh, we can um, well, we can reach those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so one of the big things that's driving this is just uh, growth and change in Alamance County. Um, uh, the population of the county has grown 30% since 2000. So you see that change when you're driving around. And, um, really what we're, what we're trying to do with, with the plan, the purpose of it, uh, is to promote the health, safety, and welfare of uh, the county citizens, guide and manage growth and change uh, that, that we know uh, has come and is, is on the horizon, uh, protect property values and investments, and then also improve uh, the quality of life for residents and also attract and retain businesses. Um, the schedule, uh, as Tanya mentioned, the process began last summer. Um, we really got started in earnest in October, uh, so it's been a year-long process. Uh, we've had to, to, to deal with some issues, uh, <laughs> namely the coronavirus, uh, but everybody has, has uh, been really great to work with at the county, and Tanya and her staff have have been really willing uh, to pivot uh, and, and uh, innovate and, and do some new things. So um, we've we've kind of maintained momentum throughout the process, uh, despite you know a couple weeks there <laughs> where we had to uh, make some changes. Um, we met in person. Uh, we had stakeholder meetings before the coronavirus. Uh, we had a community summit. Um, which was really great. We got together with a lot of different representatives uh, from the business community and, and towns uh, in the county and, and kind of talked about uh, issues that, that really are facing the whole county. Uh, two public meetings in September uh, in a socially distanced fashion. Uh, we used digital tools a lot, uh, probably even more than we originally uh, had planned on. Uh, the project website, virtual workshops, uh, emails, sur uh, online surveys, uh, social media, uh, Facebook next door. And, uh, we, we had uh, over 1,700 survey responses, so uh, a, lo a, lot of, a lot of feedback. Uh, one of the big things that we're talking about is just uh, policy for the county. Uh, so this, this land development plan is really uh, the guiding policy document for the county. Um, you all have the strategic plan uh, that really lays out the vision uh, for the county. And, and in, in that vision, it talks about thoughtful, growth and development. And, and, and really this land development plan is meant to implement that vision and talk about what thoughtful growth and development is for the county. Um, and 79% of survey responses uh, support additional measures to manage growth and high impact land uses. So that's a, that's a big takeaway. There's a lot of support uh, for you all to take a, a lead role in countering some of the things that are, that are coming uh, in terms of development pressures. Uh, one of the things that was kind of innovative that we did with this process was scenario planning. Uh, during, during the process, we, we kind of talked about what happens if we do nothing. What is a business as usual scenario? Uh, where you know, is, is residential growth and at what intensities and where is commercial growth likely to go? Uh, and then we also came up with two optional scenarios. Uh, a managed growth scenario that, that takes a, a more managed approach to growth and then a, a scenario uh, called the agricultural and rural character scenario that was really meant to retain agriculture and um, uh, kind of uh, guide growth and development in a way that would not co conflict with agricultural operations. Uh, and one thing that we did was ask people which, which scenario do they like, which, which if we had to come up with a set of policies and recommendations um, which scenario w would people prefer most? Uh, and overall, 74% supported the agricultural and rural character scenario. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, um, by far and away uh, the, the preference of, uh, of people that participated. Um, there was a significant amount of support for the managed growth scenario. Uh, but a lot of, uh, not a lot of people really wanted to, to, to see the business as usual, usual scenario come to fruition. So they wanted to uh, be a little bit more um, direct about uh, shaping the future of the county and, and land use um, and development in particular. Uh, so what we did is, is we took those two scenarios, the agricultural and rural character scenario and the managed growth scenario, and came up with a future land use plan that really talks about where we want growth, at what intensities, and some policies that really support those two uh, kind of <coughs> visions. Um, so the draft plan is available on the AlamanceCountyPlan.com website and also the, the county uh, planning uh, department website. 
uh, and um, I'm going to provide some highlights about what's in the plan, but it, it, it is a, 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 a longer document, so I can't go into everything, but I, but I do want to kind of start with the vision and goals. The vision is your vision. Uh, that, that you all established at the strategic plan. This land development plan is a tool to implement a part of that vision. Uh, and, and then there's also some goals associated with land use and associated with quality of life and public services and infrastructure, uh, economic development and leadership. It's all part of uh, that vision that, that, that you all set and then we're just getting into a little bit more details. The future land use map is really meant to be um, uh, a guide for uh, development uh, in the in the future in the county um, it, it, it kind of talks about different areas and what types of development we want to see what's the character of those areas and uh, a couple of things that it tries to accomplish is focus growth in and near municipalities uh, so um, this orange area is really called the municipal growth area and and that includes ETJs and some other areas near towns it just makes sense for um, uh, for the county to grow in and there to be a certain level of public services and where infrastructure can and should go. Uh, and then it also has defined opportunities for commercial and employment lane uses in the county. About 90% of non-residential uh, property values are actually in the ETJs or in, inside towns. But we do want to, to identify some areas in the county for uh, job growth and, and commercial growth. Uh, a, big, uh, a, a big priority for this plan is protection of rural character in less developed areas. So when you drive into the county, um, the goal is for it to feel like you're in the county, even 10 years from now, even 20 years from now. And right now, um, you don't really have the land use controls or protections to, to, to do that, but this is, this is kind of setting the path uh, for, for that. Uh, and also decreased development pressure in agricultural areas, so darker green areas. Those are areas where there's a concentration of existing agricultural operations. Uh, prime farmland uh, and uh, really where uh, agriculture was the most viable long term so we want to make sure that we do our part to, to support them. Um, promotion and protection of agriculture is a very big thing uh, in this plan. Uh, one of the main policy recommendations uh, discouraging higher density large-scale subdivisions in rural residential and agricultural areas is recommended. Uh, and then design requirements for new neighborhoods to reduce their impacts on existing agricultural operations. Um, a lot of times we're concerned about you know, industrial development coming near residential. Uh, well, the, the same type of impacts can happen with agricultural operations. If you have an agricultural operation and you have 100 acres and, and you've been there for 100 years, if you have 100 homes or 200 homes that, that, that locate right beside you, there can be conflicts there uh, because the new residents aren't used to what you've been doing on your piece of land for 100 years. So there's some, there's some design things that we can do in order to reduce impacts of those new uh, residential neighborhoods on agricultural operations. We're not saying there's not gonna be any, but we're saying we can make them as, as, as uh, fit into the landscape and into uh, the existing community as good as we can. In promotion of agricultural in the county, there's a lot of recommendations uh, that, are, that are really related to, to your um, agricultural uh, economic development plan that we're, we're endorsing as well. Um, a note here, uh, and this is kind of applicable throughout, but um, bona fide farms are exempt from zoning regulations. So e even if we, we, we recommend zoning for the county and, and you all implement zoning for the county, those operations are exempt from those, um, those regulations. Uh, and, um, and that's important because uh, they're going to they're gonna continue. What we're, we're recommending is land use regulations that, that kind of are aimed at those things that conflict with agriculture. Uh, so that's important. Um, another thing that we can we're recommending is updating subdivision regulations uh, and or new zoning districts and this is this is really meant to tailor new development to make them fit a little bit better in the landscape so you can increase base lot size requirement or you can add open space requirements so uh, uh, these this graphic on the top right is kind of current regulations typically if a new subdivision comes in they're not required currently to have open space or have buffers uh, adjacent to existing uh, agricultural operations. So they're not, they're not required to do tree saves or, or buffers on the front to where you, you don't see backs of homes when you're going down a, a rural road, that sort of thing. So there's some things that you can do from a lot size requirements, requiring open space or certain types of open space, 
uh, and, and a lot of other things you can do tree saves and buffers and landscaping requirements to that new development to, to make it fit a little bit better. As far as non-residential goes, we want to encourage commercial lane uses in certain areas, encourage redevelopment of sites, um, limit the size of commercial outside uh, municipal areas, and some modest design requirements, but not, not, not really heavy on the commercial design requirements. High impact lane uses are a very important topic that, that the county's been wrestling with um, for a year or two. Um, we want to have targeted areas where, there, where those high impact uses are allowed with some performance measures. So um, the existing heavy industrial development ordinance or updated uh, version of that. And then um, restricting these uses in certain areas, especially agricultural use, uh, areas. Uh, and you can, there's a number of different ways you can restrict those uses. A new zoning district or overlay district could require a more intense review and decision making process. Instead of just meeting standards and then they're automatically approved, there, there are different ways that give this body and the planning board um, more um, kind of legislative decision making uh, in, in those sort of um, questions. So economic development is a big part of this as well. Uh, the work that Mac's doing um, in order to uh, to kind of balance the tax base is really important. Uh, partnering with the chamber uh, and municipalities on, on business recruitment is important. Uh, supporting schools, downtowns, and cities uh, are important. The location of, of county functions um, really supports uh, downtown Graham and, and other towns. Support for the community college and K through 12 schools is, is really an economic development issue. Uh, we need to make sure we have good schools because that's what will draw talent here uh, and keep talent here. And promotion of agricultural natural areas and recreation is something that we really heard during the stakeholder interview process that it's important, you know, not just for, you know, uh, the identity of Alamance County, but actually for uh, recruiting new businesses to make sure that there's, uh, there's, there's green spaces outside the town, there's recreation opportunities, and, and, and these unique assets are kind of harnessed for that. Uh, kind of going along with that, building and maintaining the county park system is important. There's a tie to updating subdivision regulations by allowing or in, in encouraging or requiring open space requirements and new development, you're taking the burden a little bit off the, the, the park system because uh, it is a big county and, and, and we need to kind of share that burden. Greenway and trail easements, making sure that we're, we're um, uh, reserving those areas where we plan greenways and, and trail connections and protecting natural resources is, is really important. There's a lot of uh, uh, pieces of the plan that talk about this. The Jordan Lake Partnership um, is an organization that tries to safeguard the Jordan Lake um, uh, water quality in Jordan Lake. Everything in Alamance County pretty much flows to Jordan Lake and <laughs> uh, three quarters of a million people rely on Jordan Lake for water. So, so it's really important. Um, addressing erosion and stormwater new development is, is part of that. And, and updating the natural heritage area inventory is, is, is uh, recommended. Natural heritage areas are uh, the most unique natural assets uh, in the state. And uh, there's 30 uh, some odd of those in the county. You all, you all have lost uh, about two or three uh, since that, that update uh, a number of years ago. New development in different reasons, but making sure we have a handle on where those are and, and some policies to, to protect those, and uh, that, that's important. Um, Infrastructure is talked about, so limiting the extension of water and sewer in certain places, especially. Uh, Can you in pause for a second? Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that? Sounds like a music box. Somebody, somebody. Is somebody calling us? <laughs> My phone's turned off. Okay. Yeah, turned off. If we could all check our phones and be sure that Not they're my, muted, it sounded like it was coming out of this down. thing. That's what it sounded like from it coming out of there. So. I don't know. That's the microphone. So. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I apologize for interrupting. Please go ahead. No problem. No problem. Um, so where you where you extend infrastructure or encourage the extension of infrastructure can um, can influence uh, lane use and, and development, and discouraging extension of water and sewer from municipalities into key agricultural areas is part of protecting uh, those areas. Uh, but but support for uh, broadband internet expansion uh, it, it is included in the plan. There are some areas that are rural and agricultural, but but broadband is increasingly seen as, as a necessary sort of infrastructure for doing business and, mm -hmm. and, and equity and, and that sort of thing. So the distinction is made there. There's some um, transportation recommendations in here. How do we make sure that new subdivisions 
uh, come along with improvements that, that, that kind of reduce their impact on the transportation system. Uh, modernization of roads and intersection improvements is probably what you're going to see in the county uh, and, and what we recommend focus on in the next you know, 10 or 20 years. We're not going to get a lot of widenings of four lane roads through the county. Um, just the fact that DOT doesn't have a lot of money for that and y your roadways are, are, are lower on the tier, and that's okay. Um, we don't necessarily need four lane roads through the county. Uh, that's part of protecting that rural character. But modernization of roads, adding shoulders or doing intersection improvements to reduce peak hour uh, traffic, that sort of thing, is, is, is definitely uh, something that we recommend. Access management along major corridors is important. You have some, some pretty you know uh, heavily travel, traveled um, North Carolina highways uh, in addition to your ma your main highways in town, but you know 87 and 54 and, and some of these other ones that um, we have to be careful about what goes on. It can be literally a death by a thousand cuts if if we keep you know doing you know five driveways here, ten driveways here. Every driveway adds delay. It adds accident potential and and that sort of thing. So requiring development that comes in to have a limited number of drive cuts and be connected, either parking lots or roadways be connected, to kind of disperse traffic will be really important. And addressing some key hot spots like truck traffic through uh, Saxapod is also recommended. Um, you know, the, the Snow Camp Smart Area Plan is, is included in this as kind of the last chapter in this land development plan. But we do recommend additional small area planning efforts uh, to refine land use recommendations in some other areas of the county. The, the, uh, the southeast is, is kind of a high priority, Sax Paul and, and Eli Whitney, and, and just because it's, it shares a border with, with Orange County and we do see a lot of development pressure coming from, coming from Orange County and also coming from Mebbin from the north. Um, and then uh, Rock Creek and and Belmont and, and the north um, are also a priority, a little bit uh, lower priority than the southeast, but we do see a lot of growth and development even in the northern area. Uh, so uh, making sure that our, our land use policies are up to date and, and counter those things uh, is important. So this the Snow Camp Small Area Plan, we did take a look at the Snow Camp area and have some specific recommendations in this plan for that area. So it's not just the crossroads of Snow Camp, it's really that whole southwest area all the way out to, to Chatham um, uh, and, and Randolph County. Um, we, we spend a little bit of time in the report talking about this area, defining what the character of the community is and what makes it special and how to protect it. Um, so a couple of things we talk about is, is the historical significance um, and also the preservation of, uh, of, of natural resources and, and kind of cultural resources in the area. And we have some strategies that are really specific to this area. We also look at existing land use trends and, and natural and cultural resources. Um, some, some interesting things, uh, uh, most of, of the land down there is in agricultural use in some form or fashion, timber included. Um, and um, we looked at kind of the, the existing character of, of properties. For, uh, the average parcel size for agricultural areas in the snow camp area is, is 40 acres. The average parcel size for residential uses in the snow camp area is five acres. We also looked at what does commercial look like in the area and how, how big are buildings and, and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the trends that, that we're really looking to counter in this area and elsewhere uh, is, is kind of the, the opposite of the population growth. We see population going up and, and we see uh, acres of farmland going down. 17,000 acres of farmland lost uh, in the last 15 years. And there's a lot of things that are happening there. Uh, you know, there are some industry trends and, and aging of farmers, but there's also the development pressure uh, that we need to be conscious of. So, so uh, a couple of the recommendations in the Snow Camp Small Area Plan is uh, encourage a development pattern that's consistent with these recommendations, including on, only allowing low density residential development in to order to reduce uh, conflicts with agriculture, preserving natural and historical assets, uh, and, and again, talking about some of the tools to do that. One is the subdivision ordinance. You have the subdivision ordinance, you can increase lot size and implement open space standards uh, to, to kind of counter that and encourage the preservation of historic and, and, and rural features. And, and another thing you can do is, is restrict high impact land uses uh, in the study area. 
Uh, you could implement some sort of zoning that requires a more extensive review and approval process for large-scale residential, large-scale commercial development, and or heavy industrial uh, uses and mines. Uh, considering implementing additional regulations to manage growth in high-impact land uses is, is, is recommended. And then uh, some form of zoning, um, either in the snow camp area or in the county as a whole, can be used to kind of discourage high impact land uses and preserve agricultural and rural character. The, the county already regulates uh, use um, and subdivision through a series of ordinances. You don't have a zoning ordinance uh, and you would need to implement one in order to, to get to that other layer of approval process and, uh, and that sort of thing, but I think there is a, a lot of support for that. Uh, of all the counties in, in North Carolina, only 5% do not have zoning and Alamance County is the largest and fastest growing county uh, without zoning by far uh, in the state. Uh, so that should be uh, noted. There are a lot of different ways to implement zoning. It doesn't have to be a one size fits all thing. We, we go through and talk about some potential zoning districts. We talk about options in the plan. It will be up to the planning board and this body to determine how to move forward and whether or not to move forward on our recommendations. Uh, regardless, um, we have a lot of tools in the plan so even you, know, you can update the subdivision ordinance. You can pursue one form of zoning or another in Snow Camp or or the county, and, and we have uh, we have it laid out in terms of model and options, model ordinances and, and options in there. Um, a couple zoning districts that are relevant uh, that you could implement is just directly related to the future land use plan. You have an agricultural area that's primarily agricultural that we really want to just focus on protecting uh, those agricultural operations and from, from really dispersed residential development, large scale residential development, and then those high impact uh, heavy industrial uses. And um, you know, one is density of development. So uh, setting a higher bar and, and really encouraging more lower density development or requiring lower density development is important. Incentivizing well-designed development is something that we can do um, because we wanna balance interests. We don't wanna say you know, there's no development and we want to give property owners options. So you could set a, a higher um, a minimum lot size, but then say, oh, if you, if you design it in a certain way, you can have a few more uh, lots or more, more, more development. So the rural cluster option that we talk about is really saying, if you do it in the right way, you know, you can have um, uh, some, some more lots, but they have to be arranged in a way that protects agricultural and natural resources, that sort of thing. Same thing with rural residential. Um, we have some, some guidance in there uh, in terms of what a zoning district could look like there. Um, and this is kind of an illustrative of what we're trying to do. Current regulations, you kind of just go in, you can lot out and, and have as many lots as the soil will really uh, allow uh, per uh, the health department. But what we really want to see is, is, is more uh, a, a development that fits the area. So probably lower density. Uh, the natural resources on site that are preserved, being sensitive to our neighbors uh, in terms of um, existing agricultural uses and re residential uses. Again, you have like a lot of residential, but it's these larger lots, larger kind of homestead properties that we want to be sensitive to. Um, uh, commercial development and industrial development is something we have to deal with in this area. So identifying a rural center zoning district for existing uses or where we want to see uh, new commercial development is recommended. Um, specifying some, some criteria for that. Uh, you know, uh, we don't want, you know, a, a, a 100,000 square foot Walmart probably in this area, but a, a smaller convenience uh, store or a restaurant or, or, or uh, uh, you know, a, a body shop, something like that, that, that meets criteria and fits in the area is, is probably okay. Um, but setting a threshold for, okay, we don't want in buildings to be bigger than this or more impervious surface than this and, and we want to have some, some um, criteria to, to design the parking and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we do have to deal with existing and proposed industrial uses. Uh, so, so we can have an industrial district that is kind of a placeholder with that special approval process for new things that want to come in um, and we can decide whether that's appropriate or not when the time comes. Implementation options. So option A would be just to do uh, zoning with four, probably four districts uh, in the uh, southwest area, an agricultural district, rural residential district, a commercial mixed use or rural center district, 
and then that industrial district with with maybe a special use permit process for rezoning that um, and then you would do it, you would consider uh, uh, applying those districts or new districts to additional areas of the county based on outcome of future small area plans option b would be to do countywide zoning so you would probably need more districts six or seven uh, zoning districts for that uh, but it's a much larger effort than just the southwest to give you perspective in that southwest area there's about 3400 properties if we look at the county jurisdiction countywide we're talking about 30,000 properties so just that one task literally you know considering applying zoning to those properties um, that's going to be a lot more time intensive uh, a lot more require a lot more staff resources or consultant resources to do that another method would be to do an agricultural zoning district or, or, or overlay only in the southwest or countywide you could do a combination of a and c as well um, do the four districts in, in the southwest and then do a, an agricultural zoning district uh, protection district countywide as well but those are the options that we have in there uh, a couple other implementation steps that are needed you have to establish the, the zoning districts you have to establish those district standards we have some model uh, guidance in here um, but then you also have to do some administrative code changes uh, standards for nonconformities map the zoning districts have um, public noticing and 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 during this process you might want to update or combine other ordinance into a unified development ordinance um, and then you have to have some continued public engagement throughout this is not establishing zoning or, or anything like that this plan doesn't it just provides a menu of options and some direction on how to move forward um, but but you all have to uh, kind of take the steps necessary to, to move it forward and customize it to, to where it fits um, and budget concerns and time uh, table goals and all that uh, because there's different time tables for just doing the southwest or just doing or doing countywide as well so the next steps are uh, really uh, you know having the planning board meeting on the 12th um, and they might um, either uh, either approve it or not approve it or approve it with conditions and say we need to kind of change these things or think about these things going forward uh, and then the plan will also uh, theoretically uh, be before you all on the on the 16th to, to discuss and approve or approve with conditions uh, or or require more discussion on um, so that's all i got i think now's a good time to, to take care of this because basically you can lose three commissioners after november so i think now's the time to make a decision for people who've been here long enough to know the county. So thank you for your information. No Let me ask a question, if I may. And correction, Bill, four. Four. <laughs> well, we <laughs> hope four. <laughs> we uh, forgive me, me don't you? but <laughs> forgive me, but I am a road person, and I thought your touch on roads was very minimal at best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you can't build or develop if you can't get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know we don't build roads, but we made a strategic mistake, didn't we, Brian? Because uh, I want you to talk about the uh, uh, fact that we got off the transportation, the road. Didn't we get off of that and put it over to the city? So the uh, most of our road planning, uh, the name of the group escapes me Brian now. The, the MPO, MPO, yes, is, is primarily driven by the municipalities in the state. So we have, I think we have a representative. Yeah, uh, I've been on that committee for own. a long time. Mm -hmm. And 54 is part of that discussion mm -hmm. as far as putting new intersections, getting in and out. And, and it's 54 is, is the one main, you know, you got the Mevin Bypass, but then you have 54 that's scheduled for widening. Mm -hmm. But it's on that, it, I think it's on the 2030 or 2040. I don't yeah. know whether it's funded it's or not. It's pushed out and it's yeah. getting pushed out further. Right? Everything's getting pushed out. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody I understand widening. <laughs> but my point is, is ask the sheriff. I bet, I don't even, I haven't even let you know. How easy is it for you to get gas in Graham and get to anywhere on the northern part of our county? Tough, tough, tough. Mm -hmm. I would think so. I mean, it's a nightmare mm -hmm. uh, for a, a, a fairly so-called progressive county with 160-some thousand people. I mean, I had somebody down in the southern part of the county one time want to know how to get to a 
somewhere up on the north end. They were going to, I don't know tell you where they were going. But I said, I like you too much to try to tell you. I mean, it's yeah. a nightmare. And yeah. We've been told, I have anyway, uh, that the, and I mentioned this to you last time, that the northern outfall is, I've been told that's the best part of our county to develop, but you got to get there. You got to have mm -hmm. roads. Now, I know we don't build roads, mm -hmm. but, uh, I think, in my opinion, if we just, well, I'm not going to be here, and none of us are going to be here, but I love roads. Mm -hmm. I've always been intrigued by roads. I've seen places build roads before the development so they can have some bridal growth out to the road. Mm -hmm. I've seen it all over. And the, uh, it's almost like our attitude in this county is to not push for good, the access roads or, or the loops or the um, roads. You build roads before you actually need them. And, and then you're glad you did. But it's almost like we're just not pushing for the road development as we should be. And I don't think this is. Mm -hmm. No offense. I mean, I don't. Mm -hmm. And you... And then you develop with around what you got, which, in my opinion, just throws it all in a clump. Mm -hmm. And you got all this developed area, undeveloped area that's ripe for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I, that's just the way I feel. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you know it is lacking is kind of east-west connectivity outside of of the main highways. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you really need is you need to kind of string together. You know, some sort of. It's probably right on the edge of, of the towns and ETJs mostly, uh, but it could it could benefit you, especially on the north and south side. Um, and I, and I think you know Burlington Graham MPO is kind of the lead organization. They just just got done with with their uh, thirty year plan, their their metropolitan transportation plan, and they had a real challenge of their their wishes, <laughs> and and what they could fit into their fiscally constrained budget 54 is one they thought that was going to be funded mm -hmm. in you know in a, in a in, in a lot sooner than it ended up um kind of in their plan as just because they don't they don't have enough they won't have enough money dot won't have enough money the, the highway trust won't have enough money to to fund their needs but it, you know speaking that if there is a, a specific um task or, or thing that, that we really need to figure out as a county and it, and it helps the towns and it helps the county and you know east west connectivity uh, you know, along those, or, or even kind of north south through the towns, is something that that you all could work with towns and, and Burlington Graham MPO um, to to study more, see you know, see what what kind of feasibility of some improvements, um, and, and also if there's any any other uh, funding options or go after grants and, and go after projects and that sort of thing. I think you all are already doing that by participating in, in the MPO, but if you all wanted to include something in this plan that was specific about you know, east-west connectivity or, 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 or problem area or a, a follow-up uh, study or engineering work that needs to be done. I mean, we can certainly do that. So, I mean, I, I encourage you to, you know, it, it work with staff. If there's something that, that we needed a new recommendation or a modification or a stronger recommendation in the plan about something like that, we can certainly do that. Well, you're right on east-west uh, on, on top and bottom, mm -hmm. below, above the interstate. But you got, you got three arteries on the south side coming up to the interstate but you have nothing on the northern part of the interstate that mm -hmm. isn't true going up yeah, that's yeah. True. and that's half the county mm -hmm. square mile wise uh, but well there's another well, issue the southern too. loop broadband. was taken off of there broadband yeah i mean do what broadband uh, you know as as we look at real estate or residential development out in the county people won't know until they get out there they can't get a broadband signal um mm -hmm. i'd like to know if there, if there aren't some tools that we as commissioners can use to help encourage development of broadband out there that mm -hmm. from developers. Mm -hmm. um, if you're gonna build a residential neighborhood, and I love the idea of the green space too because we just had a development put behind us where they stripped out every single tree and I mean the erosion has been horrible from that. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing that we heard in the um, the plan is is how can we make development, you know, work towards our goals, whether that's right. transportation, putting in a turn lane, making sure there's a connection to a road so they're not all dumping out on one road, but you know, broadband is as well is something that you know that the county might be able to get the developers to, to work towards. 
a mm -hmm. big problem that with your what you were talking about that development you're talking about right that's in the city i know we yeah. have no control over those developments right. whatsoever right i mean i couldn't believe the way they did that one yeah um but uh, I mean, we're, we're sitting looking at a situation where we have people working from home. We don't know how much longer that's going to happen. <coughs> people trying to find places they can connect. We have mm -hmm. children in remote learning that can't get online. We're buying hotspots that don't work unless you get in a car and go someplace where it can, can, can actually connect to a uh, cell signal. So uh, mm -hmm. um, we've got some real connectivity issues in the northern part of the county and the southern part of the county. Um, that we need to encourage. To, to Tim's some point about in. roads, I'd just like to mention Mevin Bypass, they finally have bought some right away. It's been on the books 20 mm -hmm. plus years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about mm -hmm. the money, though. Mm -hmm. And I think really there are some plans to, to knit you know, some of the roads together on the, the south side, mm -hmm. ch Chestnut. The Southern Loop has actually been taken off. Yeah, the but, but even without the Southern Loop, there there is a way to kind of. Uh, I think it's another bridge over the hall or something or, or a connection down there near the high school but um, but we can kind of look into that and, and yeah. see what we can we can recommend it's all for about sure. the money though that's true or investment well lack of well plus the way the state yeah. raises money to do well drugs. you know up in Rockingham County mm -hmm. I lived up there for for 10 years when I got out of college and the state put in roads to help develop part of that. What was that? It's called Loop Road up there. What yeah, they, they got plenty what of What is it called, Loop Road? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to drive Loop Road all the time. I don't know how much development they got off of it, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, I mean, it's atrocious. For, they got in my roads, opinion, what we got in this county as far as lack of roads. Mm -hmm. I, I will give you a little input on the design for developments. I, you start cutting them too big a lot size, developers aren't going to develop because right. there's not enough money. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of taking density with open space which gives you less roads going mm -hmm. in whatever smaller lots but having more green space which right. keeps the county looking more on yeah. the rural yeah and, that, and that's kind of the idea of that rural cluster option is, is you set a, a minimum lot size it's it's a lot higher than you can do now because right now you can you know have 16,000 square foot lots if you, if you got the right <coughs> soils and community which is you know probably not appropriate and it, when you don't have open space right but but if you if you if you have a, a certain number of lots that you can have on a property but you can rearrange them in different ways then that gives the property and the developer flexibility but also gives the neighbors some some sort of expectation that you know that they're not going to have you know 20 lots up against their one property you know which is which is something if you don't have you know those design criteria you can have you can literally have a, a four acre track somebody's been living there for 20 years uh, and then they can they can have you know 12 lots backing up to their their one property which is not probably not appropriate you want some open space to buffer them uh, and, and you could put those 12 lots but put them in a way that, that doesn't impact those those adjacent property owners absolutely and I think a absolutely. lot of the southwest development that we're gonna see is partially because Chatham has like double population in what last five years roughly yeah, and, and their area, I mean, that's that's what led them to, to, to do what they did. I mean, um, you know, establishing zoning in, in the western area, the Silk Hope area. Um, they had a few uh, kind of uh, prospective developments out there that were, were very out of character. Um, uh, so um, that's... And I think I'll ask the people do want to preserve mm -hmm. that rural agriculture. But, you know, we don't want to tell all of them to stay out. It's about balance. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can I tell a road-related story, please? Because I'm not going to get to tell it to the next meeting. <laughs> and I'm not going to be telling stories first meeting in December. <laughs> Are you going to be here the next meeting? Yeah. Okay. Well, the one in November? Yeah. Yeah, but we be won't sure. be talking roads. Oh. Probably. Okay. All right. But <laughs> I'm 70 years old. God's been good to me. But when I was 12, I lived in Alabama. Dothan, Alabama, mm -hmm. and they built a circle, the state did, mm -hmm. around Dothan, double lane highway, divided highway, perfect mm -hmm. circle. <clears throat> they called it the circle. And people said they were foolish and the state wasted money and so forth and so on. Well, one day I told my dad, I used to love to ride my bicycle. So much so, I broke my jaw and broke my arm and <laughs> <laughs> rode it pretty hard. And I told my dad, I said, look, I've 
guess what I'm going to do? He said, what? And I said, I'm going to ride around in a circle. He knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. He said, what for? I said, because I want to. 12 years old. And that sucker was about 12 to 14 miles, which is small, really. <laughs> you know, considering Greensboro Circle, or loop's going to be 40-some miles, 44 miles. Mm -hmm. But bottom line is, I rode around that circle because I was fascinated by it. And they drove up to me in a car. Mom and Dad rolled the window down. They said, you want to get in? I said, no, I'm going all the way around. <laughs> and it, I have talked about that circle <clears throat> to today. Mm -hmm. I gave it a little talk in Chicago one time about that circle mm -hmm. and of course they had heard the story. I took maps up there and so forth. So I am fascinated by roads. Look at I-40. Mm -hmm. Built 19, it was opened in 1964. Mm -hmm. No cars on it whatsoever. Highway 70 was all you had. Mm -hmm. And built in 64. I called a DOT one day, uh, Mike Mills. I believe it was in Greensboro. And I said, when did you open 40? And I told him the story that I'm gonna say now and I'm gonna shut up. Okay. But I said, we'd gone to a ball game at Wake Forest and 40 wasn't built. And we were staying at the Winston Motel, which is still there. It's not, <laughs> you don't stay there now, but back then it was a nice little motel. And they were building 40. Because I remember the concrete, I remember the glare of the dust and the concrete and so forth. And I told him that story. He said, about when was that? And I said, well, I think I was about 13 years old. He said, well, you got a good memory. He said, that was when the construction was going on. We opened it in 1964. Mm -hmm. Think of that. Yep. What if we'd never done it? Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we got it here because Chapel Hill didn't want it, if you know the history of it, supposedly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I can't help but stress enough, we've got to have roads mm -hmm. before you have proper development. Well, and it, it, and that <laughs> it illustrates how far you need to be thinking in advance. Sure. You know, because you can't just, you know, start a project, right? Um, you know, some, some projects have been in the works for 25 years before, yeah. you know, a, a right away is bought. I mean, when did the Memon Bypass start, you it's know? It's been 25. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, I agree. I'm sorry I belabored the issue. <laughs> well, I'm going to belabor a little bit more. He's retired now, Tim. Yes, he really. Yes, yes, he did. We're all at a loss for that. If I had his pension, I would too. <laughs> We're all at a loss for that, not having Mike Mills at the Department of Transportation anymore. But I'm going to belabor a little bit more with the uh, road stuff. And just mention that, uh, you know, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Sutton, about uh, putting a road out and then having the development. The problem is I, and I happen to know a few things about this. Um, there, some, there was abuse of that system in the state where developers would get the, use their political leverage to get the DOT to put out a road where there wasn't anything so that then they could develop around it. Instead of, you know, in the state, as good Republicans, we know that the state has finite resources. Other people don't seem to see it that way. They think the resource is infinite, but there's finite resources for building roads. And so projects that were needed but didn't have the political capital behind them. We're not funded in favor of things that favor developers. And I know that there was an incident in Gastonia where actually I believe it was the Republicans in Gastonia challenged that and got a bill through the General Assembly to change the way that road planning is done now and is done on a point system. So that's I think a big part of what the the uh, metro Holland. yeah the yeah. metropolitan mm -hmm. planning organizations like the Burlington Graham MPO, they I believe are involved in the process of assigning points to road projects and so that they make sure that the road project, or they try to, at least there's a process to attempt to be sure that the projects that are most needed are the ones that are actually funded. And um, so that's why you won't see probably, I, I think, uh, the state money putting a road out into what we say, you know, like the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. Things well, like I hear that. what you say, but everything I've mentioned had nothing to do with developers influencing, whether they influence the circle around Dothan, whether they influence the interstate placement or loops or whatever. I mean, I'm, good planners at the state level don't really need to probably worry about the developers as much as how to develop your state. Well, and I, I think Alamance County has been ignored. I didn't mean to suggest that, you know, 
a conflict with you know what you're saying. I'm sure that in the if the if the old process if the old process had um, been tank free, then I'm sure it would have been excellent, and that you would have had planners who are empowered to put the money where it needed to go. Um, but it's uh, rife for abuse when you get and, and, and interest one, involved. And one of the issues now is just DOT doesn't have enough money to fund the roads that actually do meet the equity formula and like need you know a road connection. So so that's right. one and of the. I issues happen to know now. some things about that too. <laughs> yeah. um, I've been learning and studying a lot about the DOT in the last ten months, and um, it was a you know remember in 2019, of course, we had the terrible hurricanes and we saw the pictures of the fish left on I-40 from the storm surge and everything. So the DOT had budgeted about $50 million in its budget for storm-related expenses and I believe they spent well over $200 million on that. And then they had some uh, trouble with some accounting problems that uh, may or may not have been a result of inadequate in, uh, oversight by the governor's administration. And so they ended the fiscal year, I think, uh, like $750 million in the hole. And so we're all, you know, all the citizens are really put in a bad spot because of that. Mm -hmm. And um, there's going to be a lot of attention needed for the DOT in the next couple of years to try to get it straightened out. Also, another huge problem with the DOT is that, one, gas prices are cheaper, so gas taxes are down. Mm -hmm. Two, there's the virus, and so people haven't been driving as much, so gas tax revenue is down. And then three, there's a big push to move toward uh, electric cars. And I understand that Congress is uh, looking at bills, if they've not already done them, this might be part of the Green New Deal, to require only electric cars to be sold in the United States by a certain yeah, time that's not that far ahead. Out, yeah, and so um, there's a lot of problems and issues with transportation funding. That's um, why they haven't moved the sides of the road this summer. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. I um, also wanted to say that uh, you mentioned the northern part of the county. I believe, if I remember right, that uh, soil testing shows that the northern part of the county is less ideal for big developments. It, it, it is, but um, so septic tank technology mm -hmm. has gotten a lot better, too. Um, so there's some innovative ways you can do septic, and it costs more. You know, it definitely costs more than your traditional septic tank. Uh, but it's making, you know, the price of land in other parts of the county is going up that has good soils. So it's making the, that northern part of the county m more attractive and, and, and it makes it to where, well, maybe it's worth it to spend more on a septic. So that's a concern because, you know, it used to be you could only have, you know, have, have one house per couple acres anyway. Uh, but with these innovative septic systems and the, and the cost of land going up elsewhere, it, it could could result in some pressure there. Well, a lot of the part, or a significant part of the northern part of the county is in the watershed, so you have a two-acre requirement yeah. anyway, right? One, two, depending on which type of watershed. Yeah, but and a significant part is two acres. Right area, yeah. Lake mm -hmm. Kemet, yeah. yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, which is where I live, so that's why I know so much about soil mm -hmm. quality. I look at it every day. Mm -hmm. And deal with it. Um, we'll be able to build a loop right by your house. Yeah, right. <laughs> can I, can I ask you? <laughs> Tell us your name again. You have, uh, it's Jake Petrosky. You um, have done a good job. Yes, you have. A lot of information. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. It's yes. been interesting. You've done a good job. Um, I think our question is to set a public hearing, right? Okay. Yes, I had a few more things I wanted to say. Oh, okay. Get, I sat here and listened to y'all talk. There. And there you go was patient so uh, I just especially wanted to praise the staff and their efforts and their commitment for moving forward for this process Absolutely. because it's been and this is one stop along the way you know you mentioned that we started out really I feel like this started out with the strategic plan process that the county went through in 2016 2017 mm -hmm. to solicit public input onto um, the pillars the five pillars that we have is it five or four I think it's five for uh, the county and um, smart growth is one of those pillars and this is part of that long process and this is one step along the way getting this if, if it is approved the land development plan approved is one part of that and um, I was really proud that uh, we had the virus come along and staff did not stop kept pressing forward we found a way to do it in adverse circumstances and that took commitment and planning and um, creativity and I really appreciate that. Um, 
we use technology and other methods to continue and even improve on the process. Mm -hmm. So that was great. Um, and also I wanted to mention that I, I liked when some of the things that Commissioner Boswell was saying about you know, reflecting on the um, subdivision ordinance and how it can be used in itself to make a, compact the houses into a space and still have the green space. The, these are planning tools that have been widely implemented in other places. Mm -hmm. We're not inventing this stuff. We, it's been widely used all over the camp, all over the country, mm -hmm. and we're going to get to benefit from other people's experiences. And we're not experimenting. Um, these are really the things that you're talking about are mainstream mm -hmm. ideas. So, um, the last thing I wanted to mention was that uh, if you go back to the slide, that there's a ABC, there's a doing something with Snow Camp, doing something countywide, and then the blended thing. I just uh, I've gotten some comments and feedback saying that we should go we should choose option B um, maybe we should I should hold this comment until after the public hearing but just to put put my perspective and I've been involved on in this uh, pretty deep I guess through the whole way the countywide zoning I think is expensive and complex and uh, I question whether or not we have the uh, financial resources especially with uh, haven't had budget cuts this year, whether or not we have the financial resources to do countywide. And I'm a big believer in not letting the perfect get in the way of the good. There are some people who believe that countywide zoning would be perfect, but I would say that if we can get it started and get it going, then that's good. And, um, and address the issues where they really need to be addressed. Can you go back to the picture with the snow camp area on it? And this is going to be the last thing I say. So, the snow camp area, small area plan, let's reflect a minute on what's uh, outside of this area to the southwest is Randolph County and the mega site, which is yet to be developed. And I think it's um, many people anticipate that once that mega site is developed, that the companies are going to be using Highway 49 through Alamance County to get up to the interstate, that that's uh, a more um, accessible corridor than even the one the state has suggested. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on this area to um, to uh, develop into businesses and residential homes as much as possible. And that goes back to Mr. Sutton's original point that we got a plan, you know, not just planning for roads, but also planning for growth and thinking about the pressures that are on us from other places and anticipating those and having a plan in place so that we can respond to them appropriately. So that's all I'll say. And yes, we are. Uh, uh, Tanya had asked about setting a public hearing for the land development plan on November 16th at 7 p.m. And I'd also ask if anybody wants to make that motion that, and we haven't talked about this, uh, Mr. Haggard and I have not talked about this ahead of time, but whether or not we need to plan to move that meeting down to the historic courthouse. I think that's probably a wise idea because uh, if there's interest in this um, uh, public hearing, people want to comment on it, uh, we have and we have attendance. We're still pretty limited, even in the overflow, to try to stay socially distanced to 20 to 25 people. So it, it would probably uh, be wise to consider moving it to the historic. Should that be in the same motion, or it should be two motions, you think? You could put it in the same motion. <clears throat> you good? Yep. I'll make a motion that we uh, set the public hearing for our next meeting and to hold the next meeting at the historic courthouse. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Lashley. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. Would y'all, is there anybody who would like to take a break at this point? Are y'all ready? Okay, let's take a 10 minute recess, please. We're all ready. Uh, the next item on the agenda is consideration of a Parks and Recreation and Parks Commission appointment. And Brian Baker, our Director of the Parks, is here to present. Brian, welcome. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have a couple spots to fill on the Recreation and Parks Commission. So I'm here to uh, present the candidates to you and provide the input of um, of the rest of the commission. 
Um, so as I said, two positions open. We solicited applications and got eight responses back, which was great for us. Um, but now we have to make some choices. So the first of those positions um, is preferred a, re a reappointment. Uh, Lee Isley is the chair of our commission, um, and this would be his third term. Um, so his second term has expired, and uh, the Recreation and Parks Commission has recommended that we reappoint him to that position. Uh, the other opening is currently vacant. Uh, so the Recreation and Parks Commission examined all the candidates, asked them all if they wanted to come to a meeting to learn more and explain uh, what, what their interest was in being uh, part of the Recreation and Parks Department. Um, and after that process, they are recommending Mr. Travis Sapp as the second member. Mr. Sapp is here today. Um, he's a employee of the University of North Carolina, lives in Swepsonville, and is on the uh, Swepsonville Town Council. He um, has become familiar with our department through participating in our homeschool hike program and our homeschool programming for his children and is a frequent visitor to our parks. Uh, so he is the recommendation of the Recreation and Parks Commission um, for that second spot. How do you spell that last name? It's S-A-E-P. You related to any saps in South Carolina? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Maybe in Georgia. <laughs> 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 My best buddy in high school was a sap. Okay. Ms. Cherry Grove. Do, do we need to do these appointments? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to make a, a nominate. I would like to nominate David Woody uh, for to fill that job. Nothing personal. And um, what about Lee Isley? Lee Isley also. Yeah, um, Lee Isley. I know both David and Lee. I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Lashley has made a motion to appoint Lee Isley and David Woody to that board, and uh, Mr. Carter has seconded it. Is there any discussion? Are they separate votes? Yeah, I think both. we can do it in one we can vote. Do both. Okay. Well, if you vote, you like one, but you don't. You're not going to vote for the other. Is that require two votes, or would that just be separate motions? Well, he we made could, it as one motion, but he could, I don't know. I could separate it or whatever. Right. We, we well, could, yeah, we whichever is proper, I mean, in because I'm going to vote one way on one and one way on the other. Okay. So. <laughs> Mr. Albright, do you have any guidance for us? In well, this since situation? Commissioner Sutton has indicated he has different opinion, I, I would suggest two votes. Okay. <clears throat> um, just amend the motion and bill. Yeah. You want to amend your motion just to be for Lee Isley at this time? Right, yes. Okay, and you second that? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, is there any discussion about uh, reappointing Lee Isley to the Recreation and Parks Commission? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, and then, uh, so that takes care of that one. Do you second motion by David Woody. Second. Okay. And, and before we vote, y'all yes. recommended who? Mr. Sapp. Okay. And that's who I'm going to vote for. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any comments? Just thank you for volunteering. Absolutely. I received, uh, as far as uh, explaining my vote, I have heard from Mr. Woody, and he asked about whether he should attend today, and I discouraged him from doing that, knowing that we weren't going to have the overflow room available and so that's why he's not here in person is because uh, I told him not to do that um, and also I appreciate Mr. Sapp's service I noticed that he as you mentioned he's on the town council for Swepsonville mm -hmm. and I think it's ideal if for county boards if we have people who are citizens who are not on town councils city councils for municipalities serving on county boards um, to get more people involved and to get uh, more diverse perspectives and you know also I understand from talking to our clerk Mr. Woody attended the County Government 101 yes he graduated mm -hmm. he did that he graduated and he mentioned to me that he had attended faithfully every time yes, and that he was engaged and was. contributed and and all that so it is correct yes um, we've you know, I want to go back to what I said, though, about, um, you know, having somebody from a town council serving on a county board. 
you know, if you don't have anybody else who's applied, I don't think it should be like a prohibition or something like that. Like nobody from a, a city council can be on a county board. But I think that if you have another applicant who wants to serve, who is qualified and so forth, then um, that would lean me in that person's favor. Is there anybody else here? Let me ask a question, form of order. Mm -hmm. Not an order necessarily, but just a description. Okay, if, if a county commissioner is on the recreation board, right? Okay, did they vote? Yes. yes. Okay. I've been on there a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't see the difference. I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, you know, the thing about being on the county, on the boards for the county is, the only way new people are going to learn what goes on in the in the each department is being a member of that board. That's right. And uh, you get the only way you can learn is being a member. I think okay. it depends on the board. Like, uh, as they appoint the commissioner designee to the DSS board, I get to vote. But as the commissioner representative to the planning board, I don't vote. I'm ex officio, mm -hmm. so it depends a bit on the, well, the individual structure vote. set up. Yeah. A lot of hair is being split, but I'm ready to vote. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, is there any more discussion? If not, uh, all in favor of Mr. Mr. Lashley has made a motion to appoint David Woody to that vacant position, and Mr. Carter has seconded it. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. All right. So that's uh, carries four to one with Mr. Sutton voting no. All right. The next item. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Sapp, for being here. I appreciate that. Um, next item on the agenda is a COVID-19 update. We have our interim health director. Um, Alex is here. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioner. Hey, welcome. Good morning, Alex. So we'll start with the Alamance County dashboard. So this was updated yesterday as of 1 p.m. Um, 17 new cases, 5,666 cumulative confirmed cases, 5,083 released from isolation. We have 490 active cases currently. Of uh, those 490, 16 are receiving hospital care. Sadly, we have 93 deaths to report, 997 close contacts being monitored, so those are folks under uh, quarantine, um, and 9,808 released close contacts. So we'll scroll down. And again, like before, I, um, when I showed you, there's the case load by day, so the amount of new cases each day. Um, we saw a spike last week. Um, and then as we go down, you can see case density by zip code with the heat map. And again, you can hover over to see how many active cases are in each zip code. Um, like we would expect, um, Burlington has the highest due to um, density. And so we'll go down. <coughs> And this is our percent positivity. So um, on October 17th, that week ending, we were at 8%. Um, and then the most recent one that was reported on October 24th, that week ending, we're down to 7.1. So um, I know we had a rise around the 17th, but it has <coughs> come down just a little bit. And that information is reported out on Wednesdays um, from the state. That just allows for time for all of the tests to get back from different facilities so that the health department, <coughs> County Health, and various doctor's offices, um, all their data can come together to um, do those numbers. So we'll go down. Um, this shows cases versus county population. Um, like we've talked about before, this is all pretty much the same. Um, the highest caseload versus population in the 20 to 39. Um, and then when you look at 80 and over, that's going to be a lot of your long-term care facilities where that caseload is up a little bit. So we'll go down and look at um, cumulative case breakdown by race. So again, it shows cases versus county population. Um, and then we'll go down just a little bit more. And this is ethnicity. So everything has remained um, pretty stable as far as uh, race and ethnicity where we're seeing the cases. So we'll go to the Elon dashboard. Um, so they update at four o'clock every day. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about that. So we update at one o'clock, they update at four o'clock. So sometimes the discrepancy in the case numbers will be related to that. Uh, they currently have 259 estimated active cases um, and had 16 new cases yesterday. So 
they have 641 students in, in quarantine, both quarantine and isolation. So that's going to include their active cases and the folks that were close contacts. Um, and so that, that just gives you an update on Elon. Um, so it appears as of yesterday, their new cases that they're adding every day is starting to come down. You can see how around the 23rd we saw a spike and then it went down just a little bit and then they did some more testing. So the 28th and 29th, um, there was a spike. Are all of their new cases counted in your new cases? Mm -hmm. It depends on if they are Alamance County residents or not. The majority are. Okay. So, so we would only. So all are part of the 17 mm -hmm. that the county registered the past 24? As long as, long as they are Alamance County residents. Okay. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, at Elon, this week I noticed Saturday they had some road closed over there. I mm -hmm. guess they had a big party or something. Mm -hmm. So are we kind of looking for a spike this week? So um, they we had talked to them on Friday about that. Um, Chair Gailey and Brian and myself had a meeting with Elon. Um, and they closed the road in order to show a movie or something. Is that correct? Where well, they I were able know. to... They had tents lit up around the yeah. campus. And they were trying to do everywhere. socially distant mask wearing mm -hmm. events that was kind of the the effort there so um, as with every holiday we've seen a spike afterwards so um, the same with Memorial Day Labor Day 4th of July um, so we would anticipate probably more cases within the next seven mm -hmm. to ten days interesting. yeah we had asked them <coughs> questions about uh, what they were doing and it, you know, with Halloween mm -hmm. and well, they um, had big tents set up and yeah they're kids running everywhere and acting college kids well they um, told us that they the university was pl providing this uh, opportunity for the students to go to be in a place where they could keep an eye on them and make sure that they were spaced <laughs> apart and not crowded back into some uh, mm -hmm. you know house somebody's kitchen in a house a whole bunch oh, of okay. them and doing all that so Elon University went to um, some energy effort to make sure that they had alternatives, suitable entertainment. It'll be interesting to watch this coming week. What, what roads were closed? Haggard Avenue. It was Haggard, yeah. Haggard Avenue. Mm -hmm. Do we Don't have any cases in the jail right now? Mm -hmm. No cases so. in the I jail. I just think there's some irony in this. Three fifths, roughly three fifths, am I correct? It was. Of yeah, the county yeah. cases mm -hmm. in young. at Elon University, mm -hmm. who spent a lot of time sending people over to come to protest the jail for their cases and they have three times the number of cases that the sheriff had and we can't even get them to send kids yeah home. those antifa uh <clears throat> professors up there <laughs> maybe it's time to get their house in order <laughs> that's exactly right <laughs> well not really wanting to step in the role of the great defender of elon university <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> having participated in that call i feel like it's my responsibility and my duty to you know bring back information to you all that they embarked and you can speak more to this the a major testing program through the whole last week where they made a big effort to test everybody on campus and identify who had the virus mm -hmm. and then quarantine and isolate those people and um the numbers of people that they found having it kept going down mm -hmm. and so they have would you can say more about that yeah so they tested roughly 5,000 um, students last week um, and they plan to test this Thursday and Friday just because of Halloween and efforts to try to be ahead of things um, and so their percent positivity I don't have it right in front of me um, because every day was a little bit different but um, the cases have gone down as far as how many were positive so what they did is they took a tiered approach where they tested the folks that were most um, close contacts to the positive cases so that what you'd expect to be a little bit higher and then they went outside of that and tested more broadly how did they test did they what, what method did they did, did they use so um, they brought in a private lab and did on um, PCR tests very similarly to what we would do or can help and did they we, had a pretty fast turnaround I think they were talking about it last week and it was around 24 hours mm -hmm. Does the county do their contact tracing as well? Yes. So that caseload lo layers on top of what we are dealing can we with send them in a the bill? county. Since they don't pay tax off, maybe we can send them a bill. So they they are working with us to um, <laughs> in the state to get their own contact tracers, and so we're in the process of trying to work with them to get that set up, so that we could provide case investigation. But then, like the folks in quarantine, they could do the the contact tracing. 
You know, while we're talking about Elon, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a disgrace that that person who's in charge of Elon University hires and knows that seven members at Antifa are professors at Elon. The public needs to, needs to know that, and now they do. <laughs> Maybe. Sad there. So, Bruce, if we could go back to my slides on the other presentations. Thank you. So we'll go to the next one. I was going to ask you to go back to the county numbers for the last week that you had up that showed for the last day. So we've got uh, 259 yeah. active cases at Elon right now, mm -hmm. and how many active cases do we have in the county? 490. And that was as of yesterday. So that's really significant, right? Mm -hmm. So what would our positive percentage be if you extrapolate the Elon students, roughly? Sounds like New Jersey. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have that number, um, but when we talk about general population, so anyone that resides in our county for more than six months a year would be considered a resident. And so that's kind of why we don't try to extrapolate that because they're still going to the same stores we would and things like that and in our community. Um, and so it is a pretty accurate rep representation of what is out there in the community. Well, I, I was just going to a point where the school board made a decision not to reopen the schools yet because of the high count and the, the percentages and the yeah. percentage looks like it may be driven upward if from you take the half of that off, rate at yeah. Elon University. <laughs> so I, I looked at those dates um, to see and the cases didn't start rising um, at Elon until around October 23rd. That was when they okay. started seeing those high case count days and the, the school board decision was actually made before that. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, linger on this a little bit. We have 490 cases in Alamance County, 259 active cases at Elon. So 231 in the, in the whole county, we have 231 people who are active with the virus who are not affiliated with Elon. And um, yeah, I mean, I think considering you know, people's concerns about the outbreak at the jail, which was legitimate, you know, people should have been concerned about what happened at the jail and it's been dealt with appropriately and um, quickly. So um, this was a long-term care facility. Um, I think we would be equally vigorously right. interested mm -hmm. in helping to make sure that that wasn't still going on. Um, well, well, what I'm saying is the percentage of positive cases were at 6% or thereabouts, seven, right? 7.1. 7.1. So half of those people, if they weren't in school at Elon, our, what would our positive case? So I don't have that number, but I will say because I, Elon... I can guess. It's yeah. probably about 3.5. With, with Elon <laughs> testing so much, that actually drives our percent positivity right. down. So... Um, like next week when we we account for so probably not this week but the following week when we account for those five thousand tests that were done in Elon and that very small percentage of folks that were positive there okay. that will actually because what they do is they take the number of tests versus the number of positives to to calculate that and so it may actually drive our percent positivity a little bit down just so. because there's we typically only do about thirty five hundred tests a week and so that's going to put us around eighty five hundred with those tests they're doing at Elon. So. 5,000, there's not that many kids that go to Elon. They have um, roughly, I think, 7,000, and Isn't then a really? lot of them have gone home. So it'd be interesting to know how many kids are actually on campus mm -hmm. at Elon. Yeah. I think they told us in the meeting, we talked about that, the number in the residence hall. Do you remember? Uh, I can't remember if he said at least a third maybe had gone home. I, I, mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that, but it seemed like there was a significant number of students that had opted to. to to go home and do online learning. So what are they testing them two times a week or something? It depends on what group they fall in. So if they're if it's a group that's had close contact to a lot of positive cases, they would then test those people, folks. And then um, they did extra testing this past week to kind of encompass more of a university wide hmm. um, percent positivity. And, and they're doing their paying for their own testing. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? But it was a good chance to communicate to Elon the make sure that they understood that the health department nurses are doing our contact tracing and the rest of the community is counting on them too. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to 
be sure they and they indicated that they were working with Alex to try to find a way that they could be more active in their own contact tracing mm -hmm. because it's a uh, you know it's a lot for the health department to try to manage theirs and the entire rest of the, the community too so they seemed receptive to that and uh, interested in making sure the burden they weren't uh, laying a burden on the health department without knowing what they were doing mm -hmm. yeah I think that would be interesting to know they have a lot of money over there by the way and uh, it would be nice if they would contribute or at least put them some nurses over there to do that. Mr. Sutton, do you have any questions? Well, I told her I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Did you promise I? We get to have our last two meetings together. So. <laughs> well, if you put it that way, I'll think of something. <laughs> no, seriously, I sent you an email. And I wasn't going to really say anything, but it's something very interesting to me. Uh, <clears throat> let me get to it real quick. I pulled up Guilford County's uh, COVID uh, response or their dashboard on October for the, October 23rd. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a reason that, and, and I sent you the email, and you'll see it, and then if you could uh, let me know. But for instance, total confirmed. 11,578 recoveries 6,529 not, not near the ratio of recovery that we show and active cases get this now 4,879 I'm wondering if they have a different what's the word y'all use matrix matrix or whatever for determining what's recovery versus our definition of it. You see my point? Uh -huh. I wouldn't think that theirs should be that glaringly different than ours. I mean, we're showing 90, what, a huge percentage of recoveries mm -hmm. of the total confirmed. They're not. And I, I wonder why the difference. You know, that, that kind of stands out to me. They show they have active cases 4,879 of almost half of what they've confirmed. Uh, so I, I wonder if there's a different set of criteria they're using versus, and, and I know you didn't set to the bar. I don't, I don't, I don't believe you did, did you? I mean, no, we follow NCDHHS okay. guidelines. Well, see, that's my point. Then, if that's what's supposed to be the norm of how you report it uh, statewide, why is there so glaringly different? You, you see, see what I'm asking. So we we try to um, close out cases. Um, the day that they're out of isolation and we verify that they meet all the requirements that NCDHHS sets forth. So um, our nurses work really hard to do that so that our active case count is very accurate um, and reflects truly what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis okay. in our community. Would you assume theirs isn't accurate? I don't, I don't want to speak <laughs> to another company. Well, <laughs> again, we're right side by side yeah. and they come over here or we work over there. I do. I mean, you know, and it, it, and I'm not fussing at all. I'm just saying, to me, that stands out, and yeah. I'd like to know the difference. Yeah. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. <laughs> so um, NCDHHS uh, <coughs> is now putting out each week a cluster report to talk about where the cases are coming from. And I know a lot of folks are very interested in that, and so I just wanted to mention it comes out every Monday at 4. Um, and these are some of the things. They do key takeaways on each one. Um, so. It just talks a little bit about where the majority of the cases are coming from. So um, the there's been a rise in religious gatherings um, since mid-September cases that are coming out of those um, and associated with social gatherings. A lot of them are smaller social gatherings like parties and things folks will have at their houses. Um, and then the colleges and universities um, have continued at a steady <coughs> level since the beginning of September after the peak in August. So. I don't know if y'all remember the peak at Elon with athletics and that it, it, towards the end of August. And so, um, and then they talked about how no cases associated um, with ag or food processing or construction contractor settings have been reported in the month of October. So we had seen some of that early on in a lot of our manufacturing places. So um, those those are on the decline. So we'll go, go on to the next slide. I, I'm missing one word in there. Protest. <laughs> Where was that? But it wasn't in the takeaways. Oh, okay. I thought I, I thought I missed something. So um, I know we had talked a little bit about deaths and um, 
by race and ethnicity being stratified. And so um, there's been 93 total deaths as of yesterday at one o'clock. And so this just shows um, how it breaks down versus county population, Alamance County deaths in the state. Um, and we still have a disproportionate amount of black and African American deaths versus our county population. Um, and so a lot of the focus on our testing is, is towards that and trying to make sure we're offering testing where needed in our community. Let me ask a quickie about the deaths. You know, people, and I don't mean to be flipping here, but people died before the virus came out, before we get statistics. I'd like to know if we could go back uh, somehow in a uh, year year to date comparison of deaths two years ago or even a year ago um, as to the numbers. In other words, if we're showing X amount of deaths from say March to whatever, October, what was it? What did I say, March to October? <laughs> the previous years. Mm -hmm. And I just like to see those numbers. Because um, I'll be honest about it, I was down at the beach and this guy, uh, we were outside waiting for something and he, he was from West Virginia and his uh, daughter worked in a hospital and we just were talking he said she told him I mean, this guy was incredible looking he said they put them all down as COVID and they uh, get more money from the government yeah and in a way he said money too and uh, all of the money mm -hmm. all of the money but I would like to see a year to date and can't get it next two or three weeks mail it to me <laughs> 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 to you yeah. at the beach, right? I'll give you a South Carolina address, baby. But bottom line is, I just would like to see that comparison. So we'll go on and look at age. Um, so deaths by age group, as we ex would expect, um, over 65 being the most um, affected by COVID. So we'll go to the next slide. So our first COVID death in Alamance County was reported on April 23rd. Um, as of yesterday, 93.6 of the COVID-related deaths accounted for in Alamance County have underlying chronic health conditions. So I know we had talked about that before at previous meetings. Um, and then I included NCDHHS's um, COVID-19, uh, their definition of a COVID-19 death. And so it includes someone who's had a positive molecular or antigen test for COVID-19 who did not fully recover from COVID-19. You know, I've had... Uh it just found out last night the fourth friend come down with COVID all of whom are over 75 two of them are over 80 one has diabetes if I recall correctly one had open heart surgery and then had a pacemaker replaced in the last year and a half and all four have recovered praise the Lord Good. So I'm thinking the treatment process must be significantly better than it was when this whole process started back in March and April and May. Because so, of and it, the, it depends on if they're hospitalized or not, what, what treatment protocol there would be. Um, only one of these was hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did see on the news, they've now got a test that can do flu and COVID. Yeah, so if you're symptomatic when you're tested for COVID-19 mm -hmm. and it's sent to the state lab, um, they check symptomatic and they'll test for both. So we'll go to the last slide. So this is death by population, um, and this just shows um, the amount of deaths that are, um, have occurred in long-term care facilities versus our general population. Um, and so I pulled that number yesterday. So 64 um, of our deaths so far have been from long-term care facilities and 29 of those are from the general population. Are there any questions? I, I've got one. I'm, I'm talking about the flu right now. How are we doing? Are people getting that shot? I mean, you, you can eliminate part of what you think right. you may have as COVID and, that, you know, if, I'm not saying the flu vaccine is totally a cure, but. Yeah, so, um, and I actually have a, a budget amendment about the flu in just a little bit, um, but we are encouraging folks to get a flu vaccine this year, especially with COVID, um, just to avoid the chance of having the two viruses at the same time um, is a huge um, thing that we're trying to educate folks on. And so, uh, we have been pushing the flu vaccine out as a health department um, and encouraging our partners to do so as well uh, in hopes that that will really help us. And, and is there ample supply? Mm -hmm. I know at one time used to be, was, 
you run out occasionally but yeah so um so far we have had ample supply that's good i mm -hmm. used to never believe in the flu shot till a couple of years ago and i decided i'd start taking them so i was first in line this year <laughs> <laughs> is it true that the flu shot <clears throat> only lasts for three months I don't know. I've heard that, but I don't know if it's true. I don't know. Um, I don't know the exact amount of time, and I think it would uh -huh. depend on person to person to how long those antibodies. Plus, they had an old flu shot for us, but mm -hmm. I guess <laughs> <laughs> got a little extra. I wouldn't know. I'm not old. I just oh, well, look well. old. <laughs> <laughs> Wait Tuesday night, you're gonna feel a lot older too. I uh, bet so. <laughs> I'm afraid. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Next on the agenda is a update about the um, Rock Quarry project for that is to be located in Snow Camp. Yeah, Job, that, right? Yes. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> well, we, would you like to talk about the Colonial Pipeline issue mm -hmm. as far as we go with that? You know, we have a lawsuit ongoing <coughs> with the uh, Snow Camp mine folks. M motions have been scheduled for Wednesday to dismiss that lawsuit um, <clears throat> and we'll see what the judge says with that but going back and looking at the question about the safety of the pipeline next to the <coughs> quarry uh, I would like to remind the board that we have an excellent emergency management group of people in this county and our volunteer firemen are very good and well trained and um, our fire marshal's always on the ball too. Now we had a tanker truck flip over on the highway two years ago. It spilled about 8,000 gallons of, I like to call it rocket fuel because it's alcohol. And they were out there and they contained it and nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. The pipeline people in Huntersville, <coughs> the first people to respond to that leak were the volunteer firemen. They secured the scene. They got Mecklenburg County emergency management folks involved. They were there very quickly the pipeline people showed up they put in 60 monitoring wells they put in 40 recovery wells and they were on it um, they've got a good reputation they've been in business a long time and they don't want a leak in their pipeline yeah and they have the people that are trained to prevent these type of things i've talked with the mining company attorney um, they worked up a plan with Colonial Pipeline it's very technical their engineers at Colonial know exactly how far a blast has to be from the line and they have specific parameters that have been spelled out uh, which have been I think filed with the Mining Commission so that's where that stands but um, they, they don't want anything happening to their line. There's millions of gallons of gasoline and oil and natural gas that flow through that every day. <clears throat> so responsible company is gonna take responsible action. Um, if there is a spill, I think you can learn from the lessons of Huntersville about how quickly they're gonna respond and what they're gonna do. They have tested as of October the 8th, uh, a number of residential wells within a 1500 foot radius of the location um, which is a, a radius established by North Carolina Div Division of Environmental Quality and there have been no detections of any petroleum product in those samples that they've taken uh, they also have a program where if anyone wants to they'll hook them up with uh, with a Hunterville water system no one's taken them up on that thus far so um, they don't want to do, they don't want to disclose their plans because they are a target for terrorism so they have they have a, a security system they keep watch over their line and uh, that's that's all I know at this point unless the manager has I think has talked to a representative from the pipeline company well we've had we've had numerous I'm going to pass this information out to uh, Commissioners, we've had, as y'all, as the commissioners know, we've had folks inquiring about you know, what would happen if there was a problem at the uh, snow camp site. Would uh, the you. county be prepared with a water plan of what to do Thank for you. residents' water? 
Mr. Albright's exactly right. Uh, if, if you look at this information that I'm handing you is data from the town of Huntersville. So Huntersville recently in Mecklenburg County went through a leak. Colonial Pipeline was the company that was involved. Something happened to the pipeline. It leaked on uh, property down there and was discovered. And I've looked at this information, me and Mr. Albright, and if you, if you read what happened in Huntersville when, when that was discovered, I think what would happen in Alamance County, heaven forbid, if we had a problem uh, near the quarry site, would be very similar to what happened in Huntersville. Uh, you know, your immediate reaction is going to be from Snow Camp Volunteer Fire Department, Alamance County Emergency Management, Fire Marshal's Office getting to the scene. But very quickly, if you read this information from uh, the town of Huntersville, Colonial gets on the scene very fast, and they take over that uh, that operation of stopping the leak and cleaning it up on the surface very, very quickly. They involved, as you can read in this data, North Carolina Emergency Management, uh, the National Response Center, the U.S. Department of Transportation. Colonial gets a lot of federal and state agencies involved immediately. And then the local folks, which would be Snow Camp and the uh, County EM, would work, with, would work with the cleanup effort. But then as Mr. Albright mentioned, you can see through this information uh, that I've given you, Colonial starts getting into digging wells, testing groundwater, and trying to determine who might have been contaminated by this leak. I didn't read anywhere in here where the town of Huntersville or the Mecklenburg County was doing that. It was Colonial Pipeline. But Colonial, as Mr. Albright has said before, reported to North Carolina DEQ and to the county what they were finding as they went. So as they're testing wells, as they're testing surface water, Colonial is reporting to the state and the county, here's what we're finding, here's what we're finding. So the county and the state can make sure the residents know what's going on. So while I don't think it would be possible right now to do a water plan for what might happen uh, in Snow Camp if something happened to the Colonial Pipeline on the property, I think what the Huntersville incident shows is kind of a template for what would happen here. If something were to happen to the pipeline in Alamance County, uh, your local folks are going to be involved immediately, but then Colonial, the state, and the feds, as Mr. Albright has mentioned, are going to come in and take over, and we're going to be receiving reports from them. And this information is uh, for the public that are listening. This is available on the town of Huntersville's website. They've been very transparent, have posted all these reports from uh, Colonial, from the uh, Department of Transportation, and from the state. Uh, I just simply went to the town of Huntersville site and pulled these reports. Again, I think it's been, you know, I've been trying to rack my brain about how would you, how could we do some kind of a report right now to say what we would do if there were a spill? Well, you'd have to work with the state <coughs> colonial and the feds to ascertain what the spill was how many people might be affected but what i am seeing is that's what they do they do that and then report to the county what they're finding so I, i've got one question on this this incident was basically just a failure in the pipeline is that august correct? 14th it was a leak it was the second leak at the same spot they had a previous leak in 1996. so the there were no spot. outside forces causing this leak that we know of it so might, basically it, colonial took care of their stuff they but did. if you had an incident at the mine where something got destroyed or somebody dropped a, one of the little slurry girls you know those things they blow up with slurry gels um, and it takes out a pipeline where right. does their liability start and where does colonial start well they they all have insurance and and they have their risk management people and they have the engineers and uh, one of the attachments to the letter uh, that uh, one of the callers one of the public comment people I can't remember who it was sent us three letters from from DEQ the last page of that third letter was an attachment that where Colonial said we have studied this we've done our engineering on it and there was very little risk of any damage to their pipeline from blasting if the requirements of the plan are followed. And so no one wants a pipeline leak, and uh, especially the mining company. Um, they're liable if they use too much explosive. Um, but there's a mathematical formula that they set forth in that letter, and I'm not a, I'm not so, a scientist. So how do they ensure 
that because I mean this could be a massive thing should that happen well they have they have insurance and they have reinsurance as any big company does Colonial's been in business 60 I'm not years worried now. about Colonial I'm talking <clears throat> about the mining people well, that the mining, really from the, the mining state. company I'm sure has insurance once they begin their operational process okay. they'll have insurance as any mining company would Mark Marietta or any of the companies. And is that part of their application at the state as to how they're insuring that property? I don't know if that's part of the application. I, the, what I focused on was the plan for ex use of explosives and the approval by the colonial folks. Hmm. Okay. Right. I, I mean, I was just curious because somebody's going to be responsible here. They basically right. had a failure in a line and they took care of their issue. Mm -hmm. Where is the mine in the approval process with the state right now? They still haven't gotten approval back, have they? According to the attorney, I spoke to him last week. He said the application is complete as far as he knows. Uh, they've got no further questions from them, and they're waiting on them to make a decision. I spoke to a um, uh, gentleman from the state that we worked with when they brought the public hearing to um, Sylvan Elementary School, and that was maybe a week ago. He indicated to me that uh, the process was very near the end that Colonial and um, Alamance Aggregates had entered into an agreement about how uh, to blast, what the parameters would be, which is, uh, we've talked about, and the state was reviewing that agreement because it, it, what appears to have happened is the, the Colonial and Alamance Aggregates both agree on how much explosive and the, all the particulars of each blast, but the state is reserving the right to review that agreement also. And uh, the gentleman I spoke to said they would change it if they felt like it needed to be changed, but. Um, I think they had indicated it might be another week or two, but I think that's the final step. That was the impression I got from uh, an individual from the state was this agreement between Alamance Aggregates and Colonial for the blasting particulars was pretty much the final piece, and then it would go to the director of the North Carolina Mining Program to sign off on it. So. And, the, and the blasting program, according to the mining company attorney, is a very um, scientific, it's a computer controlled detonation, that's what he said. It's not somebody with a plunger blowing something up, hoping for the best. Uh, they, they lay this out, they put enough explosive in there to create a fissure in the rock. They don't want to use too much, they don't want to use too little, but a computer sets all of them off uh, at the appropriate time so it does the job. And uh, that's the plan that's been approved by the Colonial uh, engineers. The letter you're referring to, the last one, does say they recommend that they pass it with those rules, but it says Colonial is recommending and requesting that the uh, Daner or whatever, NCDQ, include the terms and conditions shown in attachment one. Have we got attachment one? I think that's the blasting plan itself. I think I don't, so. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but I believe it was the, the plan with the, with the specifics. Yeah. Can we get a copy of that? I don't know if they'll give that to us or not because of the anti-terrorism rules. They, we can ask. We certainly ask. It wouldn't hurt. All you got to do is fly over the thing. You'll see where it is. I mean, oh, yeah. It's not like it's hidden. <laughs> now, you're being watched if you fly over, too. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Oh, they've got, sens <laughs> they've got sensors <laughs> everywhere. Now, it's Tim, incredible. Be careful. <laughs> Henry, we'll have to go another round. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think going back to um, Mr. Boswell's point, you know, people on the ground, if you have, you know, as he well pointed out, the Huntersville thing was just colonial by itself with the leak in its own pipeline. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, uh, to state it a little differently, the underlying concern is that you'll have two companies point the finger at each other, fighting about who's responsible, two insurance companies point the finger at each other, fighting about who's responsible. And in the meantime, you have people who are afraid to drink their water or don't know, you know, oh, what's cold. going on. <laughs> and these people would be looking to their local government as their closest government for some kind of help. And so what kind of, um, you know, security net could they expect from their local government? So I guess that's really a different way of phrasing the question that you were posing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even however the leak occurs, whether it's um, 
if, it, if one were to occur, if it was through just a failure of the pipe or related to some action taken by another, I, I think what we have seen with the Huntersville information is this is how Colonial would react. Colonial is going to come in immediately with local help, shut off the pipe, clean up whatever can be seen, and then pretty much take over and start testing because uh, you know they want their product you know, they want to, one, they want to save their product and keep everybody around it safe. They do want to do that. So I'm sure no matter who was responsible for the break in the pipe, this would be the process that would start happening as soon as that occurred. Now, who would pay for all of that to be done? Who would pay for the eventual bills that would come for the wells that had to be dug, testing that had to be done, and if it were determined that residents' wells had been contaminated? That would depend on if someone was able to demonstrate. I, I would imagine somebody did something outside the the, the rules of the permit, but I think from from county government's perspective, seeing the the template that happened in Huntersville, at least we would know uh, Colonial is going to come in and start cleaning this up. We will help, but our, it looks like after the initial piece, no matter how the leak would occur, our role is to receive report information from them along with the state, saying we have tested ten wells; these ten have been contaminated. Um, and then at that point, the, the commissioners could be involved with if there are finger pointing between two, the company and the mine uh, to push somebody to pay for the needed reparations that need to be done. So, I would think the state mining commission would have the ultimate hammer. They could threaten to revoke the permit for mining sure. until this is resolved. Like the pipeline commission in Washington would, would say, if you don't take care of this business, I don't, I don't know that they would shut down a pipeline, but they would they would have some uh, leverage. Yes. Well, I think this pipeline uh, is you know key to national energy infrastructure and transportation infrastructure. So it's it's going to be repaired and, and going to continue to run. Um, the, the the interest from I think the interest from county government would be once Colonial helps determine who's been affected, then who's going to have to pay for whatever needs to be done for those folks, digging them a new well, digging a community well, whatever. But uh, to me, the, the, the biggest takeaway, that, that's something you wouldn't know unless it happened. Just right. pray that it don't happen. But uh, the biggest takeaway to me is, I think we would be looking at Colonial as those who come in and um, help us identify what who needs that kind of service. And, and Colonial is a reputable corporation. They're not gonna, they're not gonna let something like that occur without trying to take care of it. Yeah, I have a lot of confidence in Colonial. It's just the mining people. We don't know them that well. True. I think that if it became an issue of argument over who had to pay for the resident to get good water again, that that could very well happen. But we would know from I think from Colonial's efforts what would need to be done. You know, who needs a new well or who needs a community well? If, if the question about who would pay for it might be something that would uh, be more up in the air. But at least the commissioners would be getting regular reports about it, told who needs it, how the testing's going, and would know there's there's a fight going on about who has to pay for somebody to get a new well. You know, talking about the security, during the Cold War, those pipelines in Greensboro were targeted uh, missiles. Mm -hmm. but, wasn't that an army? I mean, we had everything else. We had everything theirs targeted. <laughs> but uh, but the, the, if, well, the, if you knocked out those pipelines, you paralyze the East Coast. Yes. Well, the railroad track that goes through Alta Pass up in Spruce Pine, North Carolina, goes through a tunnel. And most of the coal that feeds our coal fired electrical plant comes through there, Blues Creek. Sure. And it's it's a guarded facility too. To, right at the apple orchard, you could. I know about this area. Not that I'm a terrorist, but I used to frequent it. Which got planned? You could drive a truck <laughs> right down the road into the tunnel and blow up the tunnel. And they they've got people and and sensors and things that protect that. Even more so today. All right, if y'all are ready, let's move on to our budget amendments. Um, that was not an action item, that was for information. So we have a budget amendment, two of them from the health department. All right, so we were talking about the flu vaccine earlier, and so one of the budget amendments is um, 
to be able to increase the flu vaccine coverage in the community. Um, it's just under $60,000. There's no county match needed. Um, and there's an emphasis on those that wouldn't normally have access to flu vaccine to be able to um, have access. I'll make a motion to approve Sorry. this request. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Boswell to approve and a second from Mr. Lashley. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, you got another one? Yes, ma'am. Um, so there's also an agreement addendum for WIC, and so that it's just typical WIC funding for October through May to provide those services to our community. It's roughly $20,000 with no county match. Motion to approve. Second. Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve, and Mr. Boswell has made a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda is public speakers for items which are not related to um, agenda items. And we have a few people who had submitted email comments and one person who had requested to be called. Um, Madam Clerk, would you rather go through them in the order on the sign-up sheet or would you rather call the first person first and then go to the emails? Which yeah, let, let's, can we call first? Okay, let's do that. So the first person for non-agenda items is uh, an Amy Jackson who requested to be called. I think we got several this week. Mm -hmm. You have to read what she's got to say too. Hello, Miss Jackson. Yeah. Okay, you're connected to the county commissioners meeting. Great, thank you. Hi, Miss Jackson. This um, is Amy Gailey. Can you hear me? This is Amy Gailey. Can you hear me? Yeah, just barely. Okay, <laughs> I'll move uh, closer okay. to my microphone. Um. So we can hear you, so you can begin your okay. comment when you're ready. All right. For years, you have been hearing from your community that we are ready for the Confederate Monument in Graham to come down. You, re you received a joint letter from more than 50 community leaders in June. Around 75% of the almost 1,800 votes cast in the People's Referendum, organized by Downham, North Carolina in August, favored removal of the statue. UPS expressed its, its, its support of the removal of the monument and countless community members have emailed, called, protested, and presented comments to you requesting that the Confederate monument be removed. Two weeks ago, Ms. Frank read my statement about the racist historical context of the statue and my own white privilege within that context. Mr. Wells spoke to you about the current risk to his and his family's safety posed by the monument's presence here. On Saturday, law enforcement officers used pepper spray against peaceful marchers, protesters, reporters, young children, and people with disabilities, all while that monument to white supremacy stood guard, just as it did over the lynching of Mr. John Jeffress in 1920. At your last meeting, you said that you were sorry for what had happened to Mr. Wells and his family. You denounced white supremacy. You said you didn't want people to think you were racist. Those were hollow words that are loudly contrasted by your actions, which actively enable white supremacy and, and, and injustice in our community. Let's be clear. Declaring that you are opposed to racism while standing in the way of the removal of a racist statue is an active defense of racism in our community. Denouncing white supremacy without, a, without removing a monument to white supremacy is an active defense of white supremacy. Falsely claiming that you are powerless to remove the statue when you know that the North Carolina law allows you to remove it to protect public safety is an active defense of white supremacy. Being silent on this issue too is an active defense of an ongoing white supremacist threat to the safety and well-being of our community. Brian Stevenson said, there's a history of untold cruelty that hides in silence in this country. 
You cannot hide behind your silence, your false claims of powerlessness, or your hollow condemnations of racism, because we all know those actions for what they are, active, decisive defenses of white supremacy. Before the end of this meeting today, we will all again know by your actions whether you are choosing to continue to defend white supremacy in our community, or whether you have the principled courage to commit to actions that will lead to the removal of that Confederate monument and the beginning of a process of truth and reconciliation in Alamance County. If you are truly not up to the task of Ms. using Jackson. the power invested in Ms. you the laws of North Carolina Ms. Jackson. as a Jackson. official to protect public safety, Ms. Jackson. then I believe you should resign your post. Ms. Jackson, yes. can you can you hear me? Ms. Jackson, can you hear me? Can you hear Tori? Uh, not very well. Oh, can you can you hear Tori? Can you talk to her and? Oh, Ms. Jackson, your three minutes is up. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. The next uh, person with a public comment is Douglas Powell, who has submitted an email. Your county law enforcement is a national disgrace. You gas children and the elderly, arrested clergy and reporters, and block American citizens from exercising their franchise. The only upside to the vile, hateful exhibition of white supremacist voter intimidation put on by your law enforcement officers in the shadow of a racist monument is that you have provided a crystal clear example of why citizens everywhere need to seriously consider defunding the police. My family traces its roots on both sides many generations in North Carolina back to pre-revolutionary land grants and you have made me ashamed of my Tar Heel heritage today. That's it Mr. Powell. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't get the name on that one. Uh, Douglas Powell. Douglas Powell. P O W E L L. Oak Park, Illinois. Mm. It's on the sign up sheet. Illinois? Oh, okay. okay. Maybe they ought to give the land back. <laughs> okay, the next I believe is, I uh, apologize if I mispronounce this name, uh, Canny Adon. First name K A N I, last name A D O N. North Carolina law prohibits a municipality from removing a monument owned by any state or local government body. It is unclear whether the Graham Monument <coughs> is owned by any political subdivision. However, even assuming that it is, there is a provision of the monument law that would allow for its removal. There is an exception to the law permitting the removal of a monument when a building inspector or similar official has deemed it poses a threat to public safety because of an unsafe or un dangerous condition. The monument has caused people to be assaulted, violently arrested, pepper sprayed, and otherwise injured. The county and the city commissioners have the power to declare the monument a threat to public safety and remove it. And that is it from that one. Okay. And then the last one is Clifton Carter. C-L-I-F-T-O-N-C-A-R-T-E-R. -E and Mr. Adon gave his address on the sign-up sheet is 104 Grove Crest Way. And Mr. Carter gave his address as being in Burlington. The activities of the police was a reaction to the speed at which crowd compliance took place. The movement to clear the traffic square was slow, but compliance took place as expected. The first few blasts of pepper spray were unnecessary a bullhorn would have been more effective. I felt that the spray was overkill, but expected. 
Assembly on the courthouse landing took place as expected. Peaceful assembly on the sidewalks took place as expected. The opportunity to exercise our First Amendment right to free speech and assembly on public property were grossly interfered with and not expected. I was sprayed directly in the face by a little short officer who, ulti who ultimately directed his canister in onto a disabled woman on a scooter. I helped to carry her to the medics like a wounded soldier on the battlefield. The use of pepper spray was unnecessary and excessive. There were many children and elderly citizens subjected, subjected to this barbaric behavior. The plain English explanation of the North Carolina pepper spray law speaks to its use as self-defense or deterrence from an assailant. However, the statement that stood out above all others was safety should always be a priority. Safety was not the officer's priority and there was no violence being perpetrated by the gatherers. As a combat veteran, I feel violated because I realize that now I allowed my people to walk into an ambush. The police escorted a peaceful walk down Main Street was a tactical setup that allowed sheriffs and Grand Police Department to choose when to pin down and fire on innocent people. We were slow to comply, but compliance took place. They chose the optimal time to strike. The other half of the revelation is that maybe we were set up because where there were no counter protesters to be found near the courthouse, that was the first time that happened since the protest began. The bottom line is that we don't know who had to go home to get the sting and stench of pepper spray out of their eyes, off their skin, and from their clothes, thus eliminating the opportunity to vote at that time. And that is it. Okay, that's the last public comment. Um, do we have any commissioner responses? Yeah, I, I got it. I got a response. <laughs> you know, if uh, we take that statue down, it's not going to help anybody's lives. Nobody's going to feel better today. They're not going to feel better tomorrow. That statue should not make any anybody's decision to feel good or bad. It's a piece of marble. It only exists for one reason: to honor those that fought and died in that battle. Anybody else? I agree with Bill. Mm -hmm. no, no question about it. Well, I understand that there was a deputy entered a, injured or a deputy or police officer injured in, in an attempt to prevent and action. And police officer injured one of our deputies arm is blue from here to here. And she was a female deputy. And Sheriff, you have a press conference this afternoon at 3.30, is that right? That's exactly right, and we will cover everything that needs to be covered to explain to the public exactly what went on and to you, Commissioner. And um, I think it's appropriate to share that um, you and I talked, I believe on Saturday, mm -hmm. and I encourage you to make all the information available to the public in as rapid a way as possible. Yes, sir. Is that yes, right? We have pictures, we have videos, we have it all. I think Graham has already responded with a news release too as to their participation. And uh, I mean, they were doing their jobs, it seemed to me. I don't know where the yes. discrepancy is with these people that are calling about it. But, um, yeah, that, I read their release as to what happened, and they were doing what they were supposed to, keeping the road open, right? That's correct. And if you want an independent one, pull up Mr. Tom Boney's Facebook page. He printed it like it was. Well, Mr. Drumwright signed up, as I understand it, signed an application that outlined that there was to be no 
generator or gasoline containers on the courthouse steps. That's correct. And then appealed that. I believe the county attorney was involved in the discussions about the appeal and was told that there would be no um, That's correct. authorization allowed for the gasoline containing uh, generator or for a gasoline can and then they proceeded to bring um, we had an hour-long conversation with mr. Drumright and the ACLU attorney and that was crystal clear and it was signed off on in the and permit. he signed the permit indicated so he knew what he was doing when he brought it up there violated the permit I mean, folks, we don't want anybody getting hurt in Alamance County. Not only our citizens are, uh, not our citizens are our law enforcement. So uh, I, I've said this many times, if people would simply comply with the rules and regulations, we would have a far less number of problems than we seem to be having right now. Um, I think it's appropriate, Mr. Haygood, to mention uh, you were in communication with Kathy Holland the director of our Board of Elections is that right yes and did she indicate that there was any problems that she was aware of with uh, voting on Saturday at this uh, site in Graham uh, Kathy had received one uh, concern about uh, uh, folks getting too close to the buffer zone area but uh, it didn't indicate that they had entered the buffer zone area so there were no formal complaints filed with the County Board of Elections about the proceedings uh, Saturday. Um, and we had talked quite a bit in advance of the event concerned about maintaining the integrity of the polling site and being sure that all people all people would be able to come to the early voting site in Graham on Saturday, October 31st, and be able to vote unhindered, without intimidation, and all of that. And as far as we know from the feedback we have received from Kathy Holland, we were successful in making sure that all people were able to go to that polling site. Yes. And she did not receive any complaints subsequent to the events related to the march. Not when I had spoken to her last, uh, and that was yesterday. So. So we'll look forward to the sheriff's press conference at 3.30 to learn more about what transpired on Saturday. That will be in our classroom. And, and I do want to make one statement. Those people call my house using profanity and stuff. Don't do it no more. Oh, I love them. I'm getting, I just say it right now. <laughs> Let me say this, I, I, you know, I, again, the end of November is not going to be good. First of December, you know, this country is flunking the biggest sociology class it could, it could take <laughs> as a whole. Some are passing it, in my opinion, some are failing it, but as a whole, it's pitiful. But there's no, there was a song that was out during the Vietnam era by Buffalo Springfield. For what it's worth. Huh? For what it's worth. <laughs> you got it. You got it. And there's a little verse in there that says, and nobody's right if everybody's wrong. And man, that, when you hear that, it just makes you think about it, you know, what we're doing. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but. Nebraska, I'm impressed. <laughs> what was the other Vietnam song? Uh, Purple Haze. Credence. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunate yeah. Son. Yeah. I ain't no Fortunate Son. No. Yeah. Okay, Senators. let's move on to the county manager. <laughs> come on, report. come on. It's 11.33 the day before the election. Let's move on to the county manager's report. I have no report. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> um, do we have any commissioner comments today? Nope. All right, then I uh, have a motion around here somewhere. Oh, right here. Right here. I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A6 to consider the performance of a present employee. So, I made the motion. Uh, Mr. Lashley has seconded it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, we're in closed session. Open session. So moved. Second. All right, Mr. Lashley has made a motion to return to open session, and Mr. Boswell has seconded it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So um, the board considered a personnel matter and took no action. So all the business of the board being concluded will be adjourned. Praise the Lord. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.